name's Frank Smith. I'm with Pipe Tech. I've been with Pipe Tech for 25 years. It's kind of an overall bio of myself. Graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, um, going to school at Texas A&M, studied cross-connection backflow invention into Cranfield University in England, and studied uh, hydraulic modeling and surge analysis. Um, just completed a, a cost training class, which was to be a, a certified occupational safety hazard to go into certain job sites and locations from an OSHA standpoint, being OSHA compliant, more so to protect myself so I don't, you know, accidentally throw myself under the bus so I'll have a safety harness. Um, do a lot of work offshore, oil and gas, so, you know, taking the Hewitt training and, and um, had lots of fun flying offshore. Um, different papers, I was uh, published in the uh, British Hydraulic Research paper, the uh, 11th edition, uh, last year presented a paper in Portugal um, based on modeling a dipping tube surge vessel and using the method of characteristics versus Joukowsky's uh, method of calculating transients through a piping system. Um, presented a paper at American Society of Civil Engineering Pipeline Division on the Carmel project where we tripped 27 pumps uh, and had a 4200 pipe model in the system. Um, again, giving the city assurance that their water system would not drop below 15 PSI in their system. And in that case, we also did a proof of design to the model where we put in our transient monitoring equipment that records 100 times a second that transient event. We were able to upload our data and say, okay, on May 27th at 2.15, you had a, uh, your pumps trip and we gave energy by having a surge vessel in the system to keep your, your system positive and it reacted exactly like our computer surge analysis uh, said it would. So that was fabulous. To take a step back when we look at uh, doing hydraulic modeling and surge analysis, I usually take a, a look at your basic math. We, a lot of people will say, oh, you've got all this stuff entered into your computer. Tell me, you know, the basis of the information. In this case, we're breaking down the math and we're going to go up to an 8-inch valve, close this valve in 20 seconds, and look at the cause and effect of the, the surge that was created in that 20-second closure. Uh, in this case, to make it mathematically easy, we're dealing with a short run of pipe, 1,640 feet long, 8-inch pipe, and that wave is going to oscillate out 1,640 feet and then back 1,640 feet. So in our calculations, we figure out the loss of head factor in the piping system, hydraulic resistance of the pipe, of course the length of the pipe changed to meters, diameter of the valve um, to get our K factor. Uh, as I was explaining, the next part is the critical closure time of the valve which is that wave frequency as it's traveling through our piping system. It's going two times the length of the pipe divided by the celerity of the wave. The celerity of the wave is the velocity of the wave traveling through your piping system. This example, we're using Schedule 40 pipe, 8 inch with a wave speed of 3,280 feet per second, uh, which makes this very easy because the wave goes out and comes back in literally one second. So if you had a recording device, say a pressure transmitter on this line, and you were recording pressure waves, say, once every second, again, if you did more, you'd end up with this huge data file, uh, you may or may not record that pressure wave even occurring in the system. Uh, in our system, in our, our mathematically, we're looking at a, basically a water system running at 42 PSI, so a relatively low pressure scenario. So next we take the actual time um, with our critical closure time divided by the time we take to close the valve. In this case, we're closing the valve. Uh, well, let me back up for a second because I jumped ahead. Math is exactly the same. So here we're closing the valve first in 20 seconds, okay? So if you look at closing a valve in 20 seconds and the wave that you're creating, Think about it this way, if you ever gone to the beach or sitting in a pool, or maybe a hot tub, take your hand, move it very quickly across the water, you're going to create a big wave. So if you close a valve very quickly, you're going to create a big wave. 
move your hand very slowly across the water, you'll have a little ripple across the water. So it's this change in velocity, the velocity of course being your hand, or in this example, a disc of a butterfly valve closing is creating that velocity and that push. As we go through a smaller diameter of pipe or the orifice of the valve at a given point, we're increasing the velocity of flow to that orifice. As we increase the velocity of the flow, the velocity increases but the pressure decreases. And one of the critical aspects of that is that our when we close the valve, are we dropping below atmospheric pressure? And at any case, say during a pump trip, where you have a, a pump trip going out and the change in velocity, are we dropping below atmospheric pressure to the point of cavitation? Later on, I'm going to go into detail on surge analysis and address cavitation, what happens, and the destruction that it creates. So we take the 20-second closure time. Um, and we find out our critical closure time is 0 0.05. Next we figure, factor in the uh, critical velocity at n, which is 0 0.05. We add in gravitational acceleration, the actual operating pressure that I discussed, which was 42 psi. Um, <clears throat> and we come up with a 0 0.60. Now we substitute in Joukowsky's equation with the 0.60 to get the, the change in head which in this case would be 86.6 PSI plus our 42 PSI initially. So this means that when we went up to our 8-inch valve, closed it in 20 seconds, the pressure went from 42 PSI to 129 PSI. Okay, so if we had a pressure gauge, pressure transmitter, we had set up a test bench um, either in modeling, which is going to come up with the same mathematical equations, or if we get real life data, we'll see an increase in pressure to 129 PSI. The, uh, the next example is almost saying everything is exactly the same, except for we change our closing time to 60 seconds. Again, slowing that change in velocity down in the system. At this case, we find everything being the same except for the time step. The pressure before at 20 second closure was 129 PSI, now the increase in pressure is 72 PSI. So again, to give you just some basic mathematical so that the operator in the field can see kind of the cause and effect when they walk up to a valve. You might think that's such a simple scenario. We have a lot of applications, be it uh, rail cars or barges, where you'll have a butterfly valve or a valve that they can close quickly. You think 20 seconds is uh, a long period of time, a short period of time. We see people closing valves in just a couple seconds time. Um, I'll show you later on some computer analysis and models that we've done where we have valves, breakaway couplings for ships. Say we're uh, filling a, a, a tanker or a super tanker with gasoline or diesel. If that ship breaks away from the dock, the emergency uh, breakaway valve closes in two seconds time. We have another example in the jet fuel application where in our computer model we need to close the valve in one second time to, to minimize over pressurization of the system. In these cases we have surge vessels to accept energy as these uh, events occur. This is one of my favorite pictures here. This is a 250 pound class 14 inch gate valve that's literally sheared in half. Um, in this case, this is in a, a sewage lift station where they're running four pumps. We're pumping 14,000 gallons per minute, 180 PSI. They had a power failure, negative wave went out, dropped to cavitation, high pressure wave came back. We calculated that wave went, the pressure went from 186 PSI to a full vacuum and came back at about 1,000 PSI. When that 1,000 PSI pressure came back into the pump station, the weakest link was this gate valve. It ripped it totally in half. You might think to yourself, well, don't they have a safety relief valve you know, in this pump station, especially at that pressure, 180 PSI? They did, and it also split in half. So it's bad when your safety relief valve is blown apart. Um, the manufacturer of the safety relief valve would not let me show that picture. So <laughs> the gate valve is turned appropriately so you can't actually see it. <laughs>
uh, in the next couple hours, we're going to be discussing, you know, uh, pump trips and valve closures and the transients that are caused as this occurs. Um, through the years, I've gotten a lot of great videos. This is probably one of my favorite because it really shows the oscillation of this wave traveling through your piping system. So we look at our pressure and we see an upsurge initially occurring as the valve goes closed, followed by a, a downsurge into a vacuum condition. So as we go through this class, keep in mind that the, the movement of that pipe and through our computer analysis, we're going to look at the waves oscillating back and forth in the piping system, which trying to, you know, <coughs> brings it home what's actually happening in that video. This was a, a part of a paper that was done in 2000 um, by the Fabacher Institute where they used a high-speed camera videotaping a, a transient wave generated from a pump trip. Here we're filming this at 1600 frames per second and you'll see this is a pump trip as a negative wave goes out and oscillates down the piping system. Again in this example schedule 40 steel pipe wave speed of 3280 feet per second that wave oscillates out. You'll see from a full pipe where we now have a partially filled pipe as we pull the vacuum in our piping system, you can see a very defined water line here. And every once in a while, you see some off gassing because you're pulling a vacuum um, in the water. And in a full vacuum, of course, water can't exist. It's going to start to boil. And then if we look at that, so 1,500 frames per second, we look at the high pressure wave oscillating back. <coughs> So like in the last video, we saw the piping being drawn in on itself. And that is as that negative wave traveled down the piping system. When it oscillated back, it expanded back out. Uh, so here's that wave, and it, just like at the beach, it's uh, the wave traveling to the piping system. But in this case, this wave is traveling at 3,280 feet per second. Now think for a second that you have your pump Typically on your pump, you're going to have a check valve. And a lot of people, a lot of manufacturers, different types of check valves. There's probably 20 different types of check valves out there. People have silent checks, swing checks, pump control check valves. The issue here is that your check valve is subjected to a vacuum. And if this was on a vertical turbine pump and you're in a vacuum condition, you have a swing check valve. We see in many cases where the vacuum is actually holding the disc of the check valve open and will stay open in that vacuum condition until this high pressure wave traveling 3,280 feet comes back and slams that check valve closed. Also, when we have a surge vessel, as you give energy to this negative wave traveling down your piping system, it's also going to send energy back to the check valve to close the check valve. So when we do a surge analysis, it's critical in sizing, say, a surge vessel or dampener in the system is to also look at the, the aspects, the closing aspects of the check valve itself. If it closes too slowly, we're going to have reversal of flow. You have that change in velocity that can also create a big upsurge. If it closes too quickly, well, with a surge vessel in the right conditions, that would be great. Later on, we're going to show real life data with check valves closing in like a, a tenth or a hundredth of a second. So here's our wave, it's coming back. It's going to slam our check valve closed, and then it'll oscillate back out as a negative wave. It 
So the wave's at rest, and now it, again, it's going to reverse. And then the nice, well-defined negative wave oscillating back out. So we like to have a little fun when we talk about surge, water hammer, this wave frequency back and forth in the piping system. Um, otherwise, this would be, you know, not so much fun class. So here's my example of transient waves oscillating back and forth in a piping system. Uh, the example, this is in uh, Montreal. We, we have... Um, a broken air vacuum valve and this has happened to me personally several times where the float has been destroyed because of the negative wave oscillating out collapsed the float high pressure wave came back and now we have an opening in this case we have a six inch opening which is going to allow uh, a relief line for this wave oscillating back and forth in our system so here goes the wave Just like we saw the movement of the pipe, here's the relief of the wave. Wow. Now, as you see here, the wave frequency is coming back a little bit stronger. And this would be when we collapse the vapor pocket in the piping system or say another air vacuum valve in the line slams shut. It creates a secondary surge wave in our piping system. And as you can see, that secondary surge wave coming back creates a bigger burst of energy through our broken air valve. So again, the better way of depicting that wave oscillating back and forth uh, in, your, in your piping system. So you look at this chain of events, and we're going to look at some uh, surge analysis in a minute. Um, and what happens when we have, you know, a pump trip or, you know, a valve closure. Um, <clears throat> and when we have a pump trip, if we go into cavitation, what is cavitation? It's when our, our, our fluid is going from a liquid to a gas and then coming back into a liquid depending on the conditions. So we're going to look at an example of that shock wave um, based on a uh, KY pipe surge analysis of a gold mine in Canada. <coughs> uh, it's 400 meters below surface. We can look at where the pump is located. And in the, the model, we have the availability of putting up to 10 points of our pump curve into the system. We have this modeled as um, three pumps in series. And we could add different pump examples, um, be it in parallel or in series. Again, in this case, uh, we're pumping out of the oh, excuse me, gold mine. And our elevation at the pump is at um, 1,300 feet below sea level. And we're pumping up to uh, 49 feet. So you, good um, elevation change. Um, single um, pipeline, the pipeline diameter is um, 12 inch. Um, Hayes and Williams, the roughness is 120. Um, and our wave speed is 3,600 feet per second, which is the default in the model. So from this standpoint, we have a surge vessel in place for the time being to look at the worst case scenario. We're going to turn off the surge vessel and do a surge analysis on this system. So again, it's a pump trip, so we look at the initial 
down surge that occurs in the piping system. Um, the critical aspect is the inertia of the pump, uh, which is calculated. Um, and we look at the cause and effect in the piping system. So like the video that I showed you with the wave oscillating back and forth, or the sewage uh, moving the car around, you can see the shock wave oscillating back and forth in the computer analysis. We're running the simulation for 120 seconds. Again, the software is using Joukowsky's equation, so it goes, looks at these in the segments of pipe um, and does the calculations quite efficiently, quickly. So when we started the model, you see it, there was a pause, which gives us the ability to look at the system in a steady state condition. With the three pumps in series, if we look at our, our steady state conditions, we're operating about 625 PSI, which means our pressure is going from 625 PSI to maybe 50 PSI, and then that oscillates back up to almost 1,200 PSI, so a huge pressure difference in our system. Let's take a look at a different node. So in this case, as uh, we're reaching towards the end of the tunnel itself, um, we see the pressure, our steady state condition was about 150 PSI. That negative pump trip that would drop to 50 PSI at the pump, in this case, we're dropping to, uh, um, to a full vacuum. And when we had that full vacuum, as I say, we're going from a vacuum condition to 500 PSI when we collapse that vapor pocket that was created um, through the cavitation. And you see the oscillation and the movement of the pipe. So I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd want to be in that tunnel when they turned off the pump. A neat thing about the modeling software is that you might want to compare the difference between the pump pressure and the, almost the top of the piping system. And we can compare those two pressure graphs during the, both time steps. So we can see what the pressure is with the pump and the pressure towards the top of the line, the pressure difference and the head loss in the system, but you see the cause and effect of your overall piping system is quite detrimental. So again, this is our worst case scenario, three pumps running in series, power failure. Uh, in this application, they did not have variable speed drives uh, and they had a standard swing check valve. I mentioned variable speed drives and pumps because a lot of people look at variable speed drives as ways of um, reducing or they think maybe eliminating water hammer scenarios. Um, from a computer surge analysis standpoint, we look at the worst case scenario. It is what's the maximum amount of pumps that can run, and the worst case scenario is a power failure. So if I was relying on my variable speed drives, let's just say normally operating at 50 hertz, well, some, someone ran, runs it up to, you know, 100%, what happens when we have a power failure? So regardless of how their day-to-day -day operations, we look for the worst case scenario, in this case, a pump trip at maximum speed. So there's our problem and our solution is we wanna give energy to this change in velocity in the, the pump trip. Um, by putting in a, a control valve, um, can't give energy. It can relieve that energy, but the, the, the issue there when we have a safety relief valve is that we've created this down surge at the pump. And let's just say, okay, you've designed and modeled your system to have a safety relief valve, okay? Well, that negative wave travels throughout the whole entire piping system, as I showed you in the video, and then oscillates back as a positive wave. So if you put your safety relief valve there, you've already subjected your whole piping system to the worst shock, which is the initial transient that occurred when we turned off the pump. So you've subjected your piping to a vacuum condition. If we look at that video of welded steel pipe, you can see the stress that vacuum condition put on the pipe. That is a worst case scenario if we're dealing with, say, 
PVC pipe or you know piping that that uh, cannot handle the stresses. Um, through w research done in Europe, PVC pipe will allow a minimum pressure of about two minus two psi for ductile iron pipe minus six. Um, but for most cases, we're looking at trying to keep the piping system from dropping into a vacuum condition in itself. So let's see what happens when we size a surge vessel. And in this case, we have a uh, 141 cubic foot uh, surge vessel with a pre-charge pressure of 150 PSI. In the surge analysis, I'm going to put that in service and let's look at the cause and effect in our system. course, same steady state condition, 650 PSI. Before the negative wave, it dropped out at 50, came back at, what, 1,200 PSI. Now we're looking at the negative wave dropping to 400 PSI and coming back at basically our 650 PSI. Uh, we're, we're not going above that. Again, <coughs> we gave energy at a certain rate. As you see the slope of our curve here, we're not giving all of our energy all at once. We're gradually filling in the void that we've calculated and we're doing this through the hydraulic resistance through the, the vessel itself. And again, to, to um, minimize the transient wave. One of the best parts about the software is you can compare uh, the data of before and after. It's like, this is what your life looks without the you know, surge vessel, and this is, uh, again, the, the line with it in service. And you can see it uh, greatly uh, reduces that oscillation in the wave, and in this case would keep the piping within the maximum um, operating pressure of the system. So in this case, you're, if you're looking at, you know, um, 300 pound class ANSI flanges, you know, piping that's rated to 720 PSI, we're dealing with a system that meets the ANSI requirement and the pressure rating of the pipe or far exceeds that. So if you look at just the risk assessment in your, in your project and how to mitigate that problem, it's putting in the surge vessel and giving energy would, would uh, be a, a, a huge uh, plus in protecting our piping system. And again, you can, this is the worst case scenario. Um, the ways of minimizing this transient wave is that, yes, indeed, you could also add in variable speed drives, gradually ramping down the VFD. Uh, and in the computer modeling software, we can put that step in there. Or you can also put in pump control valves or electromotor operated valves with a controlled uh, shutdown speed, whether you'd leave the pump running or ramp the pump down and slowly close the valve off at a period of time as you gradually come to zero velocity. So at that point, we could get this line even smoother. But again, this is the baseline of looking at the worst case scenario and solving the problem.